Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is Russ Roberts. He's a research fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and host of the very popular podcast Econ Talk, which was, I should add, the inspiration for Free Thoughts. But today we're talking about his new book, How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life, An Unexpected Guide to Human Nature and Happiness. I guess let me start by asking why did you write this book? Well, I wrote it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is kind of strange. Uh, it's a feeling of indebtedness to Adam Smith. I, I've learned a lot from him and it really makes me sad that people associate his name with greed, uh, which comes from a misreading of his famous book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. That book is about the effects of self-interest, which we all are self-interested. Every human being, every creature is self-interested. But that doesn't mean we're greedy, which has a I think an important pejorative uh, tone to it. So one of the reasons I wrote this book was to let people know about Adam Smith's other book, which is The Theory of Moral Sentiments. The Theory of Moral Sentiments is all about the fact that we're not so greedy and how do we understand that? How do we explain it? What are the implications? So one of the reasons I wrote it was to was to help uh, correct the record on what I think is a misunderstanding of Smith's thought and, and his importance. The second reason is that I think people associate economics with money, which is a reasonable association. But I think they associate it incorrectly, not unrelated to the Adam Smith misunderstanding. They associate it with acquisitiveness, acquiring stuff, um, with getting rich, with playing the stock market, with strategic tax practice. And that's part of economics, some of that a little bit. But what economics is really about is about how to get the most out of life. And it's about making choices. It's about the fact that our time is precious and scarce and finite. And I think what Adam Smith's other book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, is really about deep down is about how to use our lives and our time wisely and um, in ways to bring satisfaction and happiness and good to the world. And I see that as a fundamentally economic-oriented activity. And I wish more people did. I wish more people understood that economics isn't just about money. It's about choices. It's about complexity. And those themes run through Adam Smith's – both of Adam Smith's books actually but in particularly in the, in the theory of moral sentiments. The other thought I have is that people often talk about what's good for the economy as if somehow the economy is independent of us. It's a separate entity. And I hate that idea. I think uh, we are the economy, those of us acting in our individual cho- – through our individual choices by joining with others at times in, in, in commercial ways but also in non-commercial ways in ways to help other people and to volunteer. And I think all of those things are important for understanding how to make the world a better place. I think economics has an important uh, set of insights into that. And uh, so in writing this book, I really wanted to bring those lessons home through understanding Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. Do you think that Adam Smith – or would he have called himself an economist? That's what everyone thinks of him now. But it seems kind of weird that he wrote these two books that are, are very different, not exactly economics or one of them at least. But there was a lot of economics in Smith's day and there was actually a lot of economics before Smith. And people have correctly observed that a lot of Smith's famous insights weren't particularly novel at the time. Uh, they were un- understood and known by other and written about by others. But I think the reason Smith's often called the first economist is he really laid out a research project for – not literally a research project, but he saw his scholarship as a research project in understanding how the world works and how people, when they get together in national ways and in economies and in trade, how those uh, actions affect people's lives. So in that sense, he was the first economist in that he had a broad – interest in a lot of those activities and he's also the first economist because he wrote a book that was so well written and so insightful that people remember it even though there are other people it is in his day who wrote economics that are mainly forgotten. So in that sense, he was an economist but he didn't see himself as that because it really wasn't a, a genre of scholarship per se at the time. He really saw himself as a moral philosopher which is what his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments is about. That was written by the way in – 
1759. The Wealth of Nations was published in 17 was published in 1759. The Wealth of Nations was published in 1776. So he saw himself as a moral philosopher, which I think most economists today are. But they don't see themselves that way. They see themselves as scientists. I think a mistaken uh, self-identification. I don't think economics is very scientific, and I think pretending it is is dangerous and unhelpful. And often, what we are, for better or for worse, is ideologues. Uh, Smith was an ideologue, but not like most modern ideologues. He was interested in a certain moral way of looking at the world. He did have a certain belief in the power of liberty, which uh, I think he was correct about. But he was a preacher in many ways and his book uh, that we're talking about today, The Theory of Moral Sentiments that my book is is based on is really a form of preaching. It's a mix of how the world works and how Smith thinks it ought to work. It's a mix of here's how I think you behave and here's some advice on how you'd be happier if you did this, that and the other. And that's – modern economists do that too but they don't like to think of that and they like to think of themselves just these – uh, sort of um, sterile uh, lab technicians in white coats, planning what's good for the economy. Number turning one, dials, turning and dials, twisting levers, them, yeah. and lifting levers. And number one, they don't know exactly how the dials are connected to the real economy. And number two, more importantly, is that they're doing things that are good for some people, not for others. And but they pretend that they're doing them for the quote health of the economy or for the good of society. And again, I think that's a very dangerous um, mode. Smith was very focused in, in the theory of moral sentiments on personal behavior, uh, which I think is a pretty safe place to go. You begin your discussion of Smith's book with this really vivid thought experiment that that he uses uh, about an earthquake in China and our little finger. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So it's always been one of my favorite examples. I think uh, most people haven't heard of the theory of moral sentiments. Probably most economists haven't heard of it and certainly most people and most economists haven't read it. If they know anything about it, uh, they might know this example. And one of the reasons I write about it in the beginning and one of the reasons I write about it in a little bit of, of depth is because I, it's misunderstood and often quoted out of context, I think, to paint a particular – a particularly ina inaccurate picture of what Smith's about. So the example he says is, um, you know, imagine you get news of an earthquake in China and, and millions of people are dead. And remember, his time we're writing in the 18th century. There's no internet. There's no TV. There are newspapers. Um, there's telegraphs. I think maybe no, no not, not quite, yet. not yet. No telegraphs. So I don't know how. I don't know how long it takes news of a of an earthquake in China that kills, kills millions to get to your. Uh, desk. But Smith says, you know, when you hear that, you're going to show some concern. You're going to be a little sad. And he said, you might, if a business colleague approached you and told you, they might wonder about your business enterprises that might be nearby if you have any. Uh, and I write about it in a modern context, Very, even though we have the internet and even though we find about, out about it incredibly quickly, we have a very similar reaction, which is, wow, that's awful. Uh, maybe I should give some charity to help people who are there. Uh, Gee, I wonder if our production facility was just was hurt when this happened. And he said, then you very shortly after that you forget about it. It's um, it's a tragedy, a horrible, unimaginably horrific tragedy. But you're thousands of miles away, and and you go to bed that night and sleep just fine. You know, I give the the example Smith doesn't, but I give the example of you know, your wife says, oh, terrible that earthquake, and you say, yeah, it is. It's so sad, and then you go back to bed. Uh, and sleep fine. He says, contrast that with how you'd feel if you were informed that you had to have your little finger removed tomorrow. Oh my gosh. Well, no, it's only your little finger. Smith deliberately chooses a, a part of our body that's not that crucial to daily life, but it still doesn't matter. It's an unpleasant thought that your little finger might be gone tomorrow, even if you're not a guitar player or, or a piano player. And so uh, he says, you'll toss and turn, you'll sleep badly. And um, that's where most people end the story. They end the story saying, see how callous and heartless we are. Uh, we care more about our little, little finger than millions of, of Chinese deaths. But that's not what Smith says actually. It's not the point of the story. It's absolutely the opposite of what Smith says. What Smith says is that this, this creates a puzzle. How is it that given on the surface, it certainly appears as if you care more about your little finger than millions of Chinese people, but if you're given the option – of saving your little finger by killing millions of people, you would never, ever do it. And that's the paradox. How could it be that if someone said, you know, you've got this surgery tomorrow. I can get you out of it, but millions of people are going to die. You'd say, what are you, crazy? I'm not going to do that. That's disgusting. And yet 
your feelings are clearly – your insides, your emotions clearly value your little finger more than those lives in some dimension. So Smith says, how is that? How do we understand – that our emotional response is incredibly self-centered, incredibly self-interested, incredibly focused on our own daily life. And yet when we make choices, when we act, we often act dramatically more charitably toward others than, than it appears we actually feel. And to explain that, Smith invokes what he calls the impartial spectator, which is an imaginary figure that you think of hovering and over you and watching, judging your behavior. And I – in the book, I have no idea whether that's what people actually do. I don't have any idea. We don't have any empirical evidence whether people worry about their – the way that other people think of them as the way that guarantees good behavior and socially beneficial behavior. Is this the same as a conscience, would you say? Or well, it it's like a conscience, but I'd argue that Smith's contribution to a conscience is thinking about where it comes from in a very unusual way. So when we think of, of why we do the right thing or where our conscience comes from, most people would say, well, you know, we learn it from our parents or we learn it from religion or we learn it from our culture. And what Smith's saying is actually not those things. Those are not what drive us to, to do things that are not always in our self-interest. What drives us to act charitably toward others, to make sacrifices for others, to do the right thing in, in, the, in certain situations is the feeling that we will be judged not by God, uh, not by our parents but by our peers and those who hear of our behavior. And so our reputation, our self-respect is what drives our desire uh, or our actions to, to do the right thing. And that's a very novel idea and it's a very provocative idea. And as I said, I don't know if it's true but what I think is interesting about it, it's a very useful way to improve your own behavior if you'd like to, which is to stop sometimes and pause and think about, gee, if, if an impartial person, not me, not my spouse even sometimes because she can be pretty partial toward me usually, we hope, uh, but somebody else, somebody doesn't have a stake in the matter, somebody who is just watching from the side and I think that's a very powerful way to think about how we should make our choices and um, it's very useful. How do we get the, the standards that this impartial spectator holds? Because I'm thinking this – what you're describing sounds a lot like other ethical traditions that we've talked about in free thought, specifically like the Greek tradition and its modern forms have this, this sense that you know, we try to we try to imagine the most virtuous person possible and then live up to their standards. In fact, you know, modern virtue ethics says like the right action is whatever a fully virtuous person in this position would do. Um, which sounds quite similar to this impartial spectator. Like how would you be judged by this person if they were watching you? But how do we fill in that impartial spectator? Because if it's just – if it's just like what what I would imagine myself watching me, then if I have terrible moral a sociopath, standards – A sociopath's right, impartial spectator might be – Might be a sociopath. Very different, yes. And, and so we – do we have something to, to give that content besides just what we would imagine like – the people immediately around us who might themselves be pretty awful people. Well, it, it, there's a lot there. Um, that's a great question. First of all, you you mentioned a virtuous person. When Smith talks about the impartial spectator, he doesn't mean – I don't think he means that you're thinking about a particular impartial spectator. Now, having said that, um, as a writer, I always think about the reader over my shoulder and uh, sometimes I have a particular person in mind that helps me think about, gee, that's confusing to this friend of mine or my or my relative or my uh, – or somebody who, who might read this and that sometimes helps me write. But I don't think that's what Smith has in mind. Smith isn't thinking – in fact, I, I, be, I really don't think this is what Smith's thinking at all. When he talks about the impartial specter, he means anybody from your circle of peers. He doesn't mean a particular person. And in particular, he means a your circle of peers that have a set of cultural attitudes toward all kinds of things, um, business, family, friends. I use a lot of examples in the book about the trade-offs we face all the time about how to spend our time at the office versus with our kids or advancing a project that might have some ethical issues about it versus saying no. These are decisions we make all the time in our daily lives. And what I think Smith is saying is, is that when you try to just think about whether you should do these things or not and how you should do them, you should think about somebody who is be watching from the outside who would judge you. Now, it's certainly true that those people could be really not so good people, in which case uh, 
you get a, a bad culture. But what Smith, I think, has in mind, well, I think he has two things in mind. One is this is a statement about how the world works. It's not a statement about the ideal world necessarily. It's a statement of the fact that this is how people behave. They look at their circle of acquaintances and friends and family and they tend to get their judgments about what's right and wrong from that, those people, not learning from them. Not, not listening to them, being lectured by them as, as you might be by your parents say, but by watching what they do, thinking about how they'd look at what you're doing and making judgments accordingly. So that, that's what he means by, by the impartial spectator. And, but you're absolutely right. It could be a really unpleasant world. Smith's writing about a time, of course, and living in a world of uh, civilized, educated um, – uh, society in the United Kingdom, moving back and forth between uh, England and Scotland and occasionally Europe. Uh, and he is swimming in a very particular set of circles, uh, highly educated people, very thoughtful people. His best friend's David Hume. Uh, David Hume's a pretty ethical guy and a good friend and, and embodied a lot of virtues that Smith respected. And so that's who his circle of friends were. But of course, if your circle of friends is something different, you, you might – you will find yourself in a culture uh, making decisions that maybe are not so healthy either for yourself in the, in the long run or the short run or for the people around you. Uh, and so I think that raises the question, you know, how, how do you get a good set of, of uh, ethical judgments? How do you get a good culture? And I write at length in the book about the fact that some cultures don't seem so healthy. And things are acceptable that are not so nice and other cultures, integrity and honesty are honored and respected and that encourages more honesty and integrity. And it's good to be in a culture that has, I think, those virtues and Smith encouraged those but he understood. Uh, he wasn't um, overly optimistic about, about humanity. He was very realistic about it. He understood that sometimes people are around people who aren't so, so pleasant. How do we get from this idea because on one level we have – Almost it seems like the most absolute base level, live in order to please other people's image of you, which could seem selfish. But then we get this quote which, which you write about at length uh, in the book, which I think addresses this point. Man naturally desires not only to be loved but to be lovely because on one level you could say, well, I'm just going to do whatever – everyone else around me thinks is a good thing to do, which would be just to appease them but also to be worth – their evaluation is the other part. Right. And I think it's worse than just being – sounding selfish. It's actually I think not so healthy to be constantly thinking about, well, is, are other people going to approve of this? I don't think Smith had that model in mind. I don't think he thought you should go around always worrying what other people thought about you. Uh, he, he had a slightly more I think subtler understanding of what, what it meant and, and the quote you bring out uh, I think highlights that. So the quote again is, man naturally desires not only to be loved – but to be lovely. And by loved and lovely doesn't mean the literal modern uses of the word. He means loved. He means respected, admired, honored, um, talked about in a nice way. And lovely doesn't mean uh, that's a lovely uh, outfit you're wearing. He means lovely in the sense of being worthy of love, being a person who deserves through one's own actions and one's behavior love, who deserves to be respected, deserves to be honored, who deserves to be admired. So he writes at length about people who earn respect and honor dishonestly, either because they deceive people or they, they're wealthy and powerful, which he points out people pay attention to the wealthy and powerful. He has a lot to say about celebrity and uh, very modern insights into the fact that it's very pleasant to be admired. Uh, and his theme in, the, in much of the book is – there's good ways to get there and bad ways. The, the not so good way is to be famous and wealthy and powerful. Uh, that does get you a lot of love. People want to know what you what you think and they care about what you wear. And when you walk into a room, all the heads turn. But uh, he says there's a better way to be loved, and that's um, to be lovely. And the way to be lovely is to be uh, virtuous and to be pro do the proper thing and the virtuous thing. And I, his point is that. A lot of people uh, fool themselves about whether they're lovely because they, we want to be lovely. We, we deep down, Smith believes that that we want to do the right thing, and when we don't, we pretend that we did sometimes. And that's uh, another whole set of insights he has about our, ourselves that I think is very deep and important. There's a really interesting part in the book that I was hoping you could talk about a bit, where you you talk about so we can we can deceive ourselves about how 
lovely we actually are and how respected we are. But there's this this idea that we can deceive others. We can you know, not do things that – we didn't actually do the thing that was worthy of respect but we tricked people into thinking we were and that somehow the – when we get praised for something that we didn't deserve, that actually cuts deeper or is worse than getting criticized for not doing something we should have. Yeah, I give the example in the book of uh, of Bernie Madoff, who every night knew his investors didn't know, but he knew that they weren't really earning their returns through his wisdom. They were earning their returns through his ability to attract new investors in what was uh, a Ponzi scheme. So that the returns weren't his sage advice or insights; they were just uh, a lie. Now. I don't know how he slept at night. Maybe he slept fine. Uh, maybe he deceived himself that the people who he was giving money to were doing good things with that money. He raised a lot of money for charities that way. Um, then lost a lot of money. It's very sad. But um, what Smith would say, I think, is that is that uh, it must have been very painful for him when he was forced or confronted by the fact that he was not lovely. He was loved, incredibly loved. People thought he was a genius. They respected him. They were grateful to him for the returns that he, he they thought he was earning for them. But he knew – they thought he was lovely because they thought he was wise and sage and, and, and prudent. In fact, he was none of those things. He was a dishonest person and as a result, he was not lovely and although he may have deceived himself from time to time, he probably had pain about his lack of loveliness. And that that's a deterrent, not a sufficient one in this case tragically. But for many people, that discourages us from doing the wrong thing. The idea that we are not going to respect ourselves because we're getting a claim that we don't deserve. And um, he really makes the point that it's not only the fact that it's dishonest. It reminds us of what we could have been. We could have done the right thing. It's bad enough that we that – we, get credit for something we didn't correctly do. But it's worse than that because we could have actually done something productive or or, or compassionate and uh, and we missed that opportunity. So fooling people to thinking that we did is uh, is grotesque. You know, it's, it's very judgmental about these kind of things. And I think in, mod, in the modern era we're a little more tolerant of that kind of uh, dishonesty and and slipperiness. But um, Smith felt that at least in his time or maybe for himself personally, he wanted to earn his praise honestly and I think most of us do too. And the self-deception part comes in interesting on that too because although Madoff may have, again, been self-deceiving or not, he has a, Smith has a lot of interesting insights about how much you can consistently deceive yourself into thinking you are lovely and that I think at one point there's a line that you referenced that Smith says that half of the world's ills are due to self-deception and you say that might be underestimating it. <laughs> yeah, that's right and I it's a once you start to think about self-deception, uh, it kind of haunts you because self-deception is a, a protective mechanism we have for our self-esteem for lots of reasons. It, it can be good to be deceive yourself but a lot of reasons it's not good. And uh, once you start thinking about it, once you can step back and be that impartial spectator over your own shoulder and realize, wait a minute, I don't have a justification for that. I did the wrong thing and if I'd asked someone outside of my circle – Outside of my – who had a stake in it, they'd say, yeah, that was that was tawdry behavior. Uh, once you start doing that, you start worrying, wait a minute. Maybe I'm doing more of this than, than I ought to be doing. And so again, I think it's a really wonderful self-improvement mechanism uh, and it's good for the world, I believe, because it, uh, it encourages good behavior. The one uh, quote you had in there, which I think you referenced to – a student of yours or a reader of yours that the universe is full of dots and anyone can draw any picture any picture they want but the question is is why did you ignore all the other dots goes back again to the worldview and and how you can self deceive yourself in, in that way yeah and we've been talking about personal decisions whether i stay late at work and miss dinner with my kids or whatever is the example that, that we might want to think about. But when we think about ideology uh, or politics generally or religion, uh, there's a terrible temptation to only pick the dots that confirm your worldview and ignore those other dots. And we have a lot of romance uh, about uh, how we come to our views and thinking about Smith and these issues force you to realize that maybe you're not quite the truth seeker that you thought you were 
and uh, that leads to a less comfortable life but I think a richer one. So I'm all in favor of it despite being a pretty ideological and religious person. Uh, but I think it's really important to keep it in, in perspective. Well, that's an interesting sort of segue because as you have talked about in the book and as you've even talked a lot about on Econ Talk, at the end of the day, there's just a lot of complexity in the world and we don't know a lot about it. And the hard thing about self-deception is you can say, well, those guys are self -de or deceived and I'm not. And, and then you say, well, no, that's its own form of self-deception. But then you have to figure out some reason why you hold your beliefs and not their beliefs, right? Correct. And you don't want to – I think you don't um – you don't want to go too far. You don't want to say, well, the world's a complex place. You can't know anything. Uh, that's not the world I want to live in. It might be a – it's not a bad maybe starting point, but but I think it, it's – that makes it difficult to live in the world. It makes it hard to uh, to to vote. It makes it hard to decide what you want to do with your life in many, many aspects. So I think um, what I try to make a case for in the book in that chapter is humility. So it's not that I don't have any views about what the right principles are. I don't fool – I try not to fool myself about the empirical evidence, say, that supports those principles. I try not to fool myself about whether those principles would um, would work uh, 100 percent of the time. So just to take an example, you know, free trade. So I'm a big believer in free trade, uh, big believer in, um, in – uh, commerce between consenting adults. So let's take an example. It's in the news lately, which is um, the, sh the sharing economy. So Airbnb and Uber uh, are cases where the regulatory apparatus is trying very hard to stomp them out and or make it harder for them. And my view is generally leave them alone. People seem to be perfectly capable of getting into a stranger's car with the help of the app that says this person has been very reliable before. They're perfectly capable of renting their home to a stranger uh, and the stranger who rents the home is perfectly capable of deciding whether it was clean or not, not based on a team of government inspectors but on the fact that past users have uh, have given this, this um, seller a good rating. And that system works really well. So I'm a big fan of that uh, and uh, most free marketers are. But they're, it doesn't work perfectly. Uh, so for example, uh, if if I rent my apartment to a stranger and that stranger then makes an enormous amount of noise while I'm out of town bothering my other neighbors, then all of a sudden the consenting adults – there were some adults in there who weren't consenting who got stuck with some of the costs. So the, the non-free marketer says, oh, see, Airbnb doesn't work. Well, I don't say that. Uh, I don't pretend that these kind of things don't happen though. So I, we need a, st a story to tell about how that kind of problem would get solved and that problem gets solved without government through the, the laws of how an apartment building is – is uh, treats its tenants, whether you're allowed to sublet your apartment or not. Apartment buildings can choose to not allow that. They can choose to allow it under certain situations. They can choose to allow it and uh, you can be sued for damages that your renters, tenants did as they st partied and, and – burst through a wall that, that impose costs on others. So the legal system can be used to solve that as well. So I think it's really important when we talk about exchange like that or we talk about, say, at a larger level, free trade. Free trade has – when we buy stuff from China, there's some people in America who lose their jobs. I don't want to pretend that tr trade's great for everybody. That's a lie. So I think what this viewpoint says about self-deception, don't, don't deceive yourself about that your views are perfect. Don't deceive yourself that there's tons of evidence that your side's always right and the other side's always got bad evidence. Be open-minded about the truth. Hold your hold fast to your principles. Hold fast to your principles, not to your uh, this particular study or this empirical evidence, because those they seem to come and go very often and with with great speed. So um, now your principles can be wrong too. But I think I'm more comfortable with my principles, which in this case, for example, means uh, decentralization of power uh, away from uh, government because of the incentives that governments fa face and because the incentives for power to be abused. That's what I'm going to stand by. That's what I'll defend. That's what I'll fight for and that's what I'm – I have to say I'm pretty confident in. So the fact that I'm aware of self-deception um, doesn't rule out the possibility that I can f feel strongly about certain things. Let me ask a question that may tie much of what we've been talking about into Smith's other work. The Wealth of Nations, which takes a seemingly on his face kind of a different view of human nature or, or the way we behave when we're suddenly in the market 
which is the self-interestedness um, that – so let's take your, your Airbnb and Uber example. Um, the, the condemnation that these places – you know, when the Uber drivers get or the Airbnb people get um, that we need to stamp this out with regulation. I mean obviously a lot of that is motivated by wanting to stamp out competition for traditional yeah, businesses. Purely self-interested by the part but, of the existing but rarely, hotels and taxi cabs. Yeah, rarely do they – that's not the expressed reason. No, it would um, <laughs> and, and so it seems like a lot of these things like that, you know, the – you can't – it's – there's something wrong about giving a stranger, you know, driving around picking up strangers um, and giving them rides or giving your apartment to someone. In in other circumstances, we would find those morally praiseworthy acts. You know, if, yeah, my neighbor gave me a ride to the metro the right, other day. Yeah, or you, you, you know, asked, someone yeah. someone like, you know, desperately their, their house burned down and they really – you know, you don't know this person at all but you offer them your apartment. We would we would praise those sorts of Great acts, example. right? Great yeah. example. And – but it seems like so suddenly when I'm going to offer you my apartment but I'm also going to ask for some money, which is often very small compared to how much you would pay for a hotel or something else to to stay in it, then suddenly this is – there's something wrong with this. It's wrong to to get something out of the deal. And that seems um, like the leap from theory of moral sentiments right, to that's the, a market economy. Right, right, because the wealth of nations is basically saying we get all of this great stuff that the market economies give us is from people – not doing this out of the kindness of their heart. I mean, this is the famous line. Not but from the benevolence of the butcher and the baker, right? So, is that is that a misreading of Smith, or how do we how do we tie these things together? Well, that's a it's a great insight that the things that we see Uber and Airbnb and these other companies doing uh, and facilitating be better work because companies don't do it. All they do is facilitate it. They're not. You know, I like to think of Airbnb as, a, as the world's largest hotel chain. They have 800,000 rooms, <laughs> uh, which I think makes them the world's largest. But of course, they're not their rooms. They have a lot of – about 800,000 franchisees. They effect, diminish transaction costs. Yeah, so it's an extraordinary did. thing. Um, you make a great point that that these companies are doing what, what people would normally applaud and yet somehow we've got to protect them. So if my brother is driving me to the airport, no one says – did you, did you check his driver's license? Has he passed a test? Is his car been inspected lately? <laughs> well, we just say, well, that's fine. His brother's staying in the airport. Somehow when money is involved, we start worrying about it. Now, one reason, as you point out, is that, well, it starts to affect other people's money and they've got a vested stake and cronies can use the political process to protect themselves. But, of course, the other reason is that we have a lot of suspicion about the profit motive. So if money's at stake as opposed to love, then I might uh, drive recklessly – uh, because I don't love you when I take you to the airport because all I care about is the money. That's the claim. And what that misses, uh, by the way, is is a combination of, of Smith's two books, which is well, I really don't want to hurt you. Um, I might be in a hurry and I might as a cab driver drive too quickly for your taste. But in general, I don't want to hurt you and more importantly – to get bring in Smith's other book, The Wealth of Nations, I want to get repeat business. So I want a good reputation. I want to be thought of as lovely, not just for my own self esteem, uh, but because I want to get customers again. And in fact, uh, I've I've argued it really goes the other way many times. Um, you know, if um, do I want my brother? Now I happen to have a particularly trustworthy brother, but do I want my brother? Does everyone out there want their brother driving the airport or to have uh, Uber show up? Uber is incredibly reliable. Um, when I uh, was in San Francisco recently interviewing a co-founder of Airbnb, I finished the interview. I'm in Airbnb's headquarters. I turned to the co the assistant who's helping with the interview and I said, um, is it easy to get an Uber X ride around here? And she said, oh, yeah, it's pretty easy. So I, I pulled out my cell phone and I pushed – uh, that I wanted a, a ride to a particular place and I got a, a message back almost immediately. Your driver is two minutes away. I stepped out of the conference room and my phone rang. I'm here. Where are you? Said my driver. Now, my brother might not reach that level of, of customer service. Um, so I what I advocate for it, I don't know. If, I suppose this is Smithian. I don't see any reason why my Uber driver that day – who turned down the music when I call, had to call my wife, who chatted with me in delightful ways about uh, his life in his home country, who took a shortcut to beat traffic so I wouldn't miss the train I was on my way to and, and did it in a way that wasn't dangerous. Uh, I assume he got satisfaction from giving me a ride and not just the pleasure he got from the couple of bucks that he made off me that 
10 minutes. So I don't know why we can't have both motives involved, a caring motive and a profitable motive. Uh, they're both important. And I come back full circle to your the way you asked the question initially. Um, the, the wealth of nations is about self-interest because we can't we can't love the stranger the way that we might want to or that we might think we could someday in a different world. Most of us, our circle of care is very is very tight. We care about our, our brother, our sister, our parents, our children, maybe a few close personal friends, maybe a few friends not so close, not so personal. But we don't care so much about the Chinese earthquake victim. We care a little bit, not zero, but we don't care a lot enough to make huge sacrifices for them because if we did, we wouldn't have any time in the in the world to do anything uh, other than that and most of us aren't built that way. So what I, what I think I say in this book or I've said it elsewhere is that you know, if you're only going to trade with people you love, you're going to be very poor. So what Smith cares about, he cares about two things and I think they're things that we should all care about which is the larger circle of strangers we trade with that sustains our lifestyle and prosperity and standard of living and our health, which is the incredible trade of world world trade of that allows specialization that's unimaginable fifteen hundred years ago. But at the same time we care a lot about the people right close to us and near us. And those are two things that are not exactly the same. And uh, we shouldn't pretend that they are and uh, we have to treat them a little bit differently. And that's yeah that's a great point, connecting those two worlds. That it's almost as if the personal world the social world is what Smith is concerned in the theory of moral sentiments and then trying to figure out how to make that broader because there's an equitable trade-off between broader trading possibilities, wealth, but you can't know everyone that you possibly can trade with. And so you can kind of choose one or the other. You can live in a closed society where everyone is incredibly caring about everyone else for the purposes of that person because they care for that specific person, not in a general way, and be poor. Or you can live in a broad society where you have different things. It, it made me think that in Uber, in the sharing economy, you really are bridging them in a very fundamental way, and almost the impartial spectator is the rating system. Something that tries to convey that kind of that kind of care you need to have for but everyone else. It also you're you're spreading the market economy. So, in the, the argument might go in an ideal world, we would care about everyone in the same way that we care about those close to us. But for all sorts of reasons, that's just not possible. And the consequences it might not even be desirable, but that so some caring though for other people is better than none at least. And what the market economy does is encourages us to be interested, even if it's at this minimal level, in other people. The Uber driver, if if he wasn't out there selling rides, would have had no contact and no interestedness in you at all. But at least now he had some, and at least now we have reasons to say care about those people in China, even if it's. As customers, we want them to contribute to our lives and we want to contribute to theirs. Well, I wish I had the quote in front of me, but Dennis Robertson, British economist uh, in the early 20th century, I think, uh, said it very well. He said uh, – I'm not going to get it right, but basically said is that what markets do is they economize on love because there's not enough love to go around. And so what a market does – and this is the way I think of it. I don't know if Dennis Robertson thought about it this way, but what a market does when it works well is it, it lets me – uh, it lets me act as if I were loved and as if I loved other people. So that when that um, cab driver asked me how I'm doing, uh, the way my brother would, right? He's my brother for those five, ten minutes in the car. Uh, in the in the full sense of that word, my brother. Now maybe he's just doing it to be polite. Maybe he's just doing it because he thinks it's good business. But the best cab drivers do it because they actually care. And I like the example of. Um, of uh, Southwest Airlines and when Herb Kelleher used to uh, – when he was the chair, uh, the CEO would go work the baggage claim on Thanksgiving and Christmas Day and he'd go down to the – this would be in, in Dallas. He'd go down to the Air Dallas airport and he'd go work the, the baggage claim to be with the people who weren't with their families and he went away from his family and he supposedly had a great time. Uh, you know, He enjoyed it. It was fun. He had a camaraderie with them. I'm sure he learned something about his business at the same time. But mainly he felt he was doing a good deed that was good for his company. And it raised, always raised the question, 
why don't other CEOs do things like that? And I think the answer would be is that they wouldn't enjoy it. They'd have to fake enjoying it. They wouldn't be very good at faking it and it wouldn't be so good for morale and, and the company and so they don't bother. But if you can fake – if you don't have to fake it, if you really genuinely care a little bit about the people who work for you, it's um, it's an incredible thing. It's not a publicity stunt. It's just part of what it is to be a – to do the right thing as a CEO. And so I think that's um, – Smith definitely believed that, that commerce was civilizing, that commerce encouraged us to treat other people well and, and, not, and actually not just pretend to, to actually treat them well and care about them a little bit. Not as much you care about yourself but a, but a little bit. Of course, love has to be economized on because you have inflationary concerns and then the diminishing – each unit of love would be worth – would be worth less if you loved everyone equally. Well, I don't know about that. And then your I, wife I, would I, wonder what the heck, <laughs> that, that cab driver, why are yeah, you loving so him nice as much as him. me? Yeah. Yeah, ex exactly. Well, that's true. That's an interesting uh, – I like that. That's, a, that's interesting. And part of love's uh, value is the fact that it's scarce. Um, they, whether the world would be a better place with a lot more love or, or a little more is I guess a tough question. Changing a uh, little bit of the, the tracks here, but I think it, it, it's still the same, the same topic. Now, a very important point we haven't touched on yet, which is who is the man of the system, uh, and possibly how does he work into the system of love and respect for the people that he's dealing with? So I said early on that there are a couple things that economists know about the theory of moral sentiments. They might know the earthquake example, which is um, uh, I think often misinterpreted, but they've at least heard of it. And then there's this other famous quote from this book, which is the man of system and. And the quote is that um, the man of system thinks he can – again, it's not verbatim, but the man of system thinks he can move the pieces of society's chessboard as if they had no independent movement of their own and that when he – when the man of system forgets that and tries to move them against their natural motions, you get chaos and disorder uh, and as long as the man of system takes into account that these pieces have their independent motion, uh, things work work much better. And What he has in mind there I think is, is – a lot. There are a lot of different men of system and a lot of different systems. But what he's talking about is, is the person who, quote, knows what's best for society, whether it's um, the drugs should be illegal, whether it's we should invade this country, uh, whether it's uh, how this – our health care system should be organized. That we need a plan and um, of course, F.A. Hayek said, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. And the man of system is big into designing and not so big into understanding and knowing and so is often either oblivious or wants to be oblivious to the fact that their underlying market forces are going to offset sometimes some of these uh, desires and goals. But this image of a chessboard of human society is a chessboard where we have our own patterns of motion is – is um, and of course the real chessboard of society is infinitely more complex than a, than a chessboard, but this idea that somehow a great hand can come down and move this piece from uh, knight's row three to over here is is a nice metaphor for thinking how uh, dangerous and destructive uh, utopian uh, theories are. And you know, some people say to me, "Oh, but you you're you're a man of system." You want free. You want freedom. That's just a different system. You, you're a libertarian. You're a classical liberal, and you know, I guess it's some rhetorical sense that's true. But my system is I don't want a man of system. So if you call that makes if that still makes me a man of system, uh, you know, I confess I am a man of system. But my system is a world without people of system, people who decide what's best for everybody, and I think that's. Um, that would be a better world. It also seems like the man of system is missing some of the insights of sentiment and fellow feeling that the theory of moral sentiments would give him if he believed that everyone was as competent out there as he were as he believes he is, or at least had the impartial spectator to check his biases and respect other people as equally worthy of respect as he gives himself. Uh, that's you know that's the tyranny of experts. That's the you know the experts know what's best for us, know what's best for you. Uh, uh, they want to impose their vision, their system on other people and I think um, the 20th century was a terrible, uh, terribly tragic uh, manifestation of the dangers of that, of that, of that worldview. So how do we take all of this, everything we've discussed today and apply it to our political system? What does it mean for the way that we should approach government? Well, uh, a couple things. Um, just as an aside, uh, those of us who like freedom and who want to be 
more or less left alone and restrict and reduce the scope of government's intervention in our lives. I think one of the lessons from this book is that it helps to be a good person. Uh, if you want other people to think the way you do, that you should be a, a good person. That makes it more likely they want to be part of your team. And I think uh, those of us who care about liberty have not done the best job at that at times and we made it harder for people who are skeptical of our viewpoint to join our team. So I'd encourage everybody out there who cares about freedom to um, be a good person. I think it probably is the single best thing you can do to advance uh, libertarian ideas, and classical liberal ideas. But I think there's, there's a much bigger lesson which is um, Smith is really one of the great expositors of – and understanders and users of the concept of emergent order, this idea that that certain patterns and certain problems get solved through decentralized bottom-up activity rather than top-down uh, centralized activity. And ironically perhaps, the theory of moral sentiments I think has one of his best – uh, explications of this idea and, and he's talking about morality. He's talking about where morality comes from and he's really saying it doesn't come from the top down. It comes from the bottom up. It comes from our own actions and what that leads to and the way I think about it is is that each of us has a role to play in helping to make the world a better place through our private, small, individual actions and they add up to a lot much in the same way that market forces aggregate to say determine the price of of apples or uh, the price of the cost of a haircut, um, that that there are a web of interactions that we all have. And, and what Smith is talking about in the moral area is that when I do a good deed, I earn the respect and love of people who see that and who know about me. And I am I am lovely as a result, and I am loved as a result, and I add to the impact of of those kind of decisions being made in good ways because people say, oh, yeah, that was good. That was good. And so we we self-monitor and we monitor others through our approval and disapproval of their actions. And it's not – it's very far from a perfect system. But what Smith's saying there is that morality and culture merge through the hundreds and thousands of interactions we have with each other, what we approve of and what we disapprove of. And I think that's a very powerful way to think about how to make the world a better place. It, it puts a little burden on us because it says free riding, which is often I think justified by economists as, quote, rational. Free riding is, um, is a bad thing. When you take advantage of the fact that other people are doing the right thing and you then do the wrong thing because they're doing the right thing, uh, because they give to charity so you don't have to, oh, yeah, they'll take care of it, you are degrading the world. It could be rational to do that because other people are still going to give charity, but you are degrading the world. And Kant, Immanuel Kant, who the great German philosopher who I think was influenced by Smith and talk about it a little bit in the book. Kant talked about morality as doing what – making when you're making decisions, you should say, well, what if everybody did this? And making a decision that's moral in that way, called it the categorical imperative. When you make a decision that's moral in that way, it, it may be irrational because you could skip out on this opportunity. You could skip out on this obligation. But what I think one way to understand what Smith is saying is that when you don't do that, when you do what is right, you help – the self-regulating part of our world and I want to expand the self-regulating part. It's gotten very small in modern times. I want it to be bigger. I want the government to let us judge that Uber driver and not judge it with a government inspector who does not have my interests at heart and uh, we shouldn't pretend that, that that inspector does. So for me, the lesson of Smith is that we want to expand the scope of bottom-up opportunity through emergent actions that we take voluntarily, not coercively from the bottom up and not the top down. So we want to expand the charitable sector. We want to help people who, uh, who, who, who are suffering and who have tough times through voluntary actions, not through government aid, not through uh, international aid, for example, which is horribly misspent. But we pretend that it's making a difference. Let's find legitimate ways that we can join together and, and, uh, and actually make a difference in the world. And I think there's a uh, – it's very, very easy to, to rationalize either of those extremes. Oh, government will just solve it because government does the right thing. That's what they're about. Or the other extreme, which is, oh, we're all in this uh, – in, we're all individuals. Well, I, Smith was not an individualist. He, he believed in the power of individuals. He believed in individual liberty. But there's nothing in Smith and there should be nothing I believe in modern classical liberal libertarian thought that says, oh, everybody's on their own. That's what a libertarian believes. 
There's no reason that we, we join together in all kinds of ways. We form businesses, partnerships, uh, new companies, new ideas. We party together. We merge together on the web. We do all kinds of things together. The key is not whether we do them as individuals or as groups. The key is whether we do it freely or whether we're forced to do it. And when we do it freely, it works a lot better. And what, what I think the lesson for, for political philosophy that comes out of Smith is that we ought to expand the scope of those kind of freely made choices to help people uh, act individually when they want but to join together with others and do things that are, that are glorious uh, when they choose to do that. It seems that uh, government intervention in the moral – emergent moral system can distort it almost as much as, as intervention in the emergent price system. For example, sapping people's ability to be good when it takes over the welfare state and charitable functions yeah. and it takes over trust by saying we're going to regulate this yeah. now and license. So it actually sucks that down, which some of Pete Becky's work, for example, on the Soviet economies had those societies very bereft of fellow feeling yeah. after the government took everything over. And I think of it as being an adult versus a child. Uh, being an adult means making choices in an uncertain world. A child, we don't let them do that because they don't have very much information. They uh, they don't know much about the world and so we keep them from crossing the street in traffic and we keep them from touching the stove when it's on and we, we regulate their behavior from the top down. But once you get outside the family, because there isn't enough, enough love to go around, I would rather see people act like adults and once they, once they become adults, be treated like adults. We make our own decisions about who to trust and um, – and who to be kind to and who to help with our charity and whether to be nice to our parents and our siblings, understanding that it doesn't always work perfectly. But it's, uh, that's the world I, I think uh, more people would want to live in if they, if they could see its potential. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts, P-O-D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.